Tonight we'll be in Galatians 5. This is the final section of the fruit of the Spirit that which should be produced in us uh, through uh, our fellowship with Him, through our uh, our calling and, and election in Jesus Christ, the sanctified life that we're to seek after as followers of Him. Let's read our context again, uh, Galatians 5, verse 16, and continuing from there. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition one to another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife. Jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control. Against such, There is no law. So we've looked at these in the past, and we've looked through uh, these things uh, in some detail. Uh, We saw uh, how that uh, uh, all those things of the flesh that we were to deny, just all kinds of ungodly action, things of a lack of uh, self-control sexually. Of course, that's exactly the opposite of where we are tonight with self-control. All of the things of the works of the flesh, evident lack of self-control, but especially we see the prevalent sin in sexual uh, misconduct and uh, giving in sexually to lust. Uh, There was also sins of false religion and bad temper, things of mistreatment of others with bad relationships, and then using and misusing uh, various substances. And all of that we're to deny uh, if we want to see the kingdom of God, and we are to instead Uh, Have these things that the Spirit produces in us, have these things mark our lives. So the things the Spirit produces, the Spirit's fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, those inward things, those things that we then display outwardly because of what's inside us, patience, kindness, and goodness, and then the other goods to come, uh, faithfulness and gentleness, of which we studied in tonight, self-control. As we talked about early on, that... (coughs) to stop one set of these and to replace them with another while living our day-to-day life is really uh, akin to rebuilding a car while it's on the interstate. Uh, We we don't often get to pull off uh, uh, in life like you would a car. If you wanted to overhaul the car, you'd pull it off in a garage. You would uh, maybe put it up on blocks. You'd take out the engine. You'd re-overhaul it. You'd put it back or put in a better, different one. And then after you got it all set up again, you put it on the interstate. Well, in the path of life, this remodeling process uh, has to be a work in progress all the time. And we've borrowed Eugene Peterson's famous phrase, a long obedience in the same direction. We're just going the same way, step by step, day by day, as we are uh, uh, rebuilding uh, and remodeling ourselves in Christ as we go. And so we've noted that we don't always see these things in perfection. Uh, Because of that, uh, we see the thing that James talked about in James 3. He talked about not being able to control the tongue, which when we have self-control, well, that'll be the first marker to let somebody know how much in control are you. Uh, Let the thing that happens, which everybody lets off a curse word or lets fly some uh, uh, a word that's ill-advised before they even think about it, This will be the first marker oftentimes is the tongue. And then, well, it just continues on. So sometimes it's the last as well, because the last memory they have of us is us, you know, uh, cussing and discussing and and cursing and yelling and screaming as we go. So we we came in hot and we left the same way. But James said about this, no one can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil. It's full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things not not be this way. 
Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives, or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh. Yet, in our lives, we sometimes see salt and fresh together. Uh, we see uh, two different fruits uh, from the same tree. So we have this war within us as we try to put in the things of the Spirit's good. Well, tonight, the last one, our self-control. Our self-control in these other goods. So we had faithfulness, uh, faithfulness primarily to God, but others can count on us too. Gentleness, that we uh, are kind, that we're thoughtful, considerate, and then self-control. And boy, doesn't self-control keep us out of a lot of trouble. If we would just have the self-control like we ought. Uh, Because when it comes to uh, sin in this world, what we find is is there's some people, they they just don't care about self-control. They're just going to do what they want to do. They're, they're, you know, like an unbroken stallion. They're, they're like a, a a horse that hadn't been broke to the to the bridle yet. It just does what it wants. Uh, they they can be hard-hearted. They can be uh, uh, callous. Their conscience seems seared. They indulge in sin. They mistreat others. They don't seem to have any qualms about it. They just act high-handed. There's some of those. Not too many. And usually we can avoid those. Oh, unless we work for them or they're our family. But usually we can avoid those. And if we have an option, we do. Uh, but most people aren't that way. It's not just uh, willful uh, sin all the time. Uh, most people uh, understand there's right and wrong. But sometimes they do wrong. And often they leave off right. And it's not because they didn't want to. And that degree, to some degree, is true even among Christians. Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Sometimes the weakness of the flesh get us, even when we're we're trying our best. Uh, but there's some who th- their life is just tossed kind of to and fro uh, because they don't have good self-control. Uh, some it's, you know, not much self-control and a whole lot of out of control. For some, it's a you know a lot of control, but these terrible, bad, and reckless moments of out of control. But uh, most people uh, somewhere live between somewhere of uh, you know having self control and indulgence in these things. Now, then there's the people, and this is what we as Christians ought to be, and this is what the Spirit produces in us, where we have a pretty firm grip on ourselves. That when temptation comes, temptation comes to not do the thing we ought to do because it's easier not to. When we see the uh, the traveler, like the Good Samaritan, uh, we know we ought to help him, so we actually do, or we try to. Uh, but sometimes there's some duties that's like, I do not want to be bothered today, and we give in. But that should be exceptional. That should be rare. Uh, we should be able to have the self-control to do the thing that needs to be done. Uh, to be the one that can be counted on. That was part of faithfulness, as we studied earlier, uh, that we please God, that we do the things that the Bible enjoins us to do. We avoid the things the Bible tells us to avoid. And we're marked by self-control. Again, not that anybody reaches that with an absolute standard of perfection. No one ever has but Jesus. I don't think we're in any fear of someone coming along and doing it now. Again, uh, but... Uh, we are still marked mainly and primarily by this, and as we grow and mature in Christ, that we grow in this. So we definitely don't want to be like it. We couldn't be like the guy who just does whatever he wants, no self-control, no thought for others. But we also don't want to be like the guy who a lot of times or kind of regular or far too often is uh, letting himself or letting others down with their lack of self-control. So, uh, yes, it is on a continuum uh, to some degree, but we need to be closer to self-control repeatedly, constantly, regularly than that which is a constant uh, or regular failure. So this word self-control, it's described as, uh, in the dictionary now, uh, self-mastery. Temperance is one of the words. Uh, We today equate temperance almost entirely in relation to uh, abstinence of alcoholic beverages. Uh, and that is an important aspect of temperance, but it's not the only one. So this is a person who's disciplined. It has willpower. 
uh, it's, uh, and here's where the uh, lexicon, uh, the lexicon gives a little bit of a commentary, just not just a definition, but a bit of commentary on the word. It's uh, the self-control is the virtue of one who's mastered his desires and passions, especially his sensual appetites. And it is a word that it comes from the same root as the word strength. So in secular Greek, this was a, a, a virtue. Now, not all Christian virtues were recognized by the Greeks as virtues, uh, particularly sexual self-control. But this is one that the, the Greeks recognized as a, as a civic virtue. And it was particularly of a, a person in power who didn't let their private interest influence the way that they governed. So I know that's been a constant charge against uh, pretty much the, this current president and the last president is that they let, you know, family uh, profit off the fact that they had power. And uh, this, uh, uh, in secular Greek, the virtue here was the was the ruler who didn't let his uh, private interest, family interest, overwhelm and overcome the public interest. And so this is an essential quality uh, that is going to be necessary to do the things that God commanded and also to abstain from the things that God forbids. And so as part of that uh, admonition to show moderation in all things, that we're controlled and we don't, that we don't get carried away. And so uh, we can find our great example, of course, uh, in in uh, self-control in our Savior. Uh, one of the first things he did uh, after declaring that he had uh, come to do this uh, prophetic work, which well, they'd find out was messianic work, uh, after he declared himself to, and, uh, to be one son of God and uh, begin his ministry, it says in Matthew chapter 4 that he fasted 40 days and nights in the wilderness and he became then hungry. He then became hungry. Yeah, I, I would say so. Uh, but uh, he had the self-control to go through 40 days. And then at the end of that uh, testing time uh, came, uh, you know, kind of a self-test. Then came the test that Satan put before him. And the first one is, hey, uh, use your power to make these stones into bread. I know you got to be hungry. You're near the end of your 40 days. It's okay to eat now. Uh, no need to wait till you get back to town to eat. Just uh, turn these stones to bread. That'd be a, a great show of your power. And uh, that'd be helpful too, wouldn't it? And Jesus said what? He said, well, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so from the beginning, Jesus showed an ironclad self-control, enough that he would face every temptation. And eventually he would, even though it was a cause of great grief and agony, uh, he would go to the cross. Uh, saying, Father, if it's possible, let's do something else. Uh, but if not, your will be done. And it, it was the Father's will, which just shows us how serious our sin was. If there's any way short of redemption of sins, aside from the death of Christ, I'm sure Christ would have been happy to see it. Uh, and the Father uh, wouldn't have had to sacrifice his son, but out of great love, he sent his son, right? That whoever believes in him uh, should not perish, but have eternal life. And, and so it's done in that way because. That helped us. But somebody had to do it, and Jesus accomplished it. And then he left us an example, as he did, uh, 1 Peter 2, for you've been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats but kept entrusting himself to him who judges rightly or righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds, you were healed. So mentioned the tongue several times in this uh, so far lesson on self-control, well, but that's the first uh, thing it talks about Jesus uh, not doing. Uh, he didn't sin with his tongue. That he didn't give any deceitful answer. He didn't revile when reviled. He didn't give any threats. Uh, you know, he should. He 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 said at one point that uh, he could call, if he wished, ten thousand angels to to uh, you know twelve legions, I guess twelve legions of angels to get him out. 
uh, of this predicament if it was so desired. But he didn't do it, and he didn't tell anybody in a threatening way. Look, dude, the angels are coming if you do this, if you keep it up. And how much would we have said if we were made to suffer that way? So uh, he is the very example of self control that we as Christians need and not to have. And preaching the gospel, uh, we have to tell out of control people, you need to learn to control yourself. You can, if you're going to be a follower of Christ, uh, you shouldn't and you can't live in that way. Uh, as in Acts 24, uh, the preaching of the apostle Paul to Felix the governor, he was discussing with him righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. I think Felix probably was okay with love of Jesus, maybe even resurrection. But righteousness and self-control, he didn't like. And the thought of judgment, now that he was informed, uh, was all the scarier. So we find that self-control is needed, and it, sometimes it is preached right from the very start of the gospel. And so we're to grow in these things. And we think about all the things that God has asked us to do, that if we didn't have self-control, would just be nigh on to impossible to accomplish, right? Uh, we're asked to be constant in prayer. Uh, Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Pray without ceasing. The, the self-control that it takes to do that uh, one time a, a fellow said that uh, prayer was one of the hardest tests for Christians, uh, devotion to prayer. Uh, he said because nobody saw him do it and he didn't. you wouldn't get much encouragement in it. It was just the, the naked truth between you and God. God knows if you pray, God knows how much you pray. And so praying in the uh, public assembly, easy to do, right? There's, there's a set time for it. It's scheduled. There's there's a person uh, given the assignment. Uh, that person uh, is, uh, you know, be, will be well received if they pray well. But to pray without ceasing, to pray when nobody's watching, to pray when you're alone, to pray, as Jesus said, in some of the Mount, going into your inner room, going into your closet. It's going to take a lot of self control to, in everything, by prayer and supplication, make you thanksgiving as well as your request and needs be made known to God. In the same vein uh, is study. You know, Solomon talked about in Ecclesiastes that uh, the making and the reading of many books, it was weariness to the body, but uh, the, especially the person who wants to be a minister of the things of the faith, uh, to a preacher. This is a preacher passage, but uh, the, the lesson uh, has application and, and can deal with all of us. Second Timothy 2 and 15 be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed. Handle accurately the word of truth. Be diligent to show yourself approved. Uh, the old translations will say there, study to show yourself approved. So uh, know the word. Uh, let, it, let it be obvious that just like the, you, you know, you see somebody who uh, knows their way around a hammer or a saw. They know how to build a thing. You see a jeweler. Uh, who knows how to put jewelry together. Uh, I remember a couple of times I took a watch to the watch repairman. And right there he took, takes the watch apart and he gets out his magnifying glass and he pulls apart all these little dials and, and these little cogs and these little springs. And like, how's that ever going to go back together? And he fixes it and he puts it all back together. And, you know, we, you got a ticking watch again. back Well, back when watches used to tick. Uh, but uh, it was obvious the guy knew what he was doing. It's obvious he could put, he could do that watch or the shoe guy back when we used to repair shoes too. Do we repair anything now? Do the kids get to see anybody fix anything? I don't know, but you'd watch people repair things, and it's obvious they knew what they were doing. They were they were craftsmen. They were artisans. Uh, they were uh, good workmen. Well, the preacher is supposed to be that with his Bible, his knowledge of God's word, his his ability to apply his learning. And uh, again, that was a preacher passage, uh, but all of us are told to, to meditate on God's word day and night. We read that last night from Psalms 1. All of us are to know the will 
of the Lord. That's going to take some self-control. You didn't learn that by doing things that were fun. You learned uh, how to uh, be a craftsman and a and a, a, a appropriate level workman by training and effort and control. So uh, we can talk about our attendance. Uh, the early church continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. Was nothing else happening in Jerusalem that weekend? I'm sure there was. But they continually devoted themselves. We're told not to uh, not to uh, forsake, not to abandon our assemblies, as some have done. So take self-control to, to go to the place of assembly and to assemble. It takes self-control to give. Now, you think about the the regular giving of the saints, which uh, supports the ministry of the word, supports the worship, supports uh, the doing uh, of these things. And that takes self-control because there's other stuff to spend the money on first, right? There's other things that uh, might, uh, uh, you might, well, I could have this toy or that toy. Uh, I, what I give at the church, I'd make a payment on something. Uh, I could have, and, and some people, they give at the travel trailer level. They could have a travel trailer, but they put in enough in, in the plate that 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 payment, uh, that would make a payment on a travel trailer or some payment on a four-wheeler or payment on a boat a payment on some other thing that's, that's fun and enjoyable uh, of this life. But instead, we're to, uh, you know, uh, give uh, generously as we purpose in our hearts, not grudgingly. Not under compulsion, because we've decided to give, not that someone decided for us, or someone's uh, twisting our arm to do it, or someone's looking over our shoulder uh, to cause us to do it. So each first day, as we prospered, we have the self-control to do that. So there's all sorts of things, these external things uh, that we do, and again, we, we should do them not with hypocrisy. Uh, we should do them not just in outward form, but there is a form to it, and there is things you can see, and you can see the progress in. And if you don't have self-control, you won't do anything in that regard, or you won't do much. And just like you, sometimes you run into a, a guy, and he he does the repair, or he tries to do the repair sometimes. Uh, he tries to build a thing, and it's like, that guy doesn't know what he's doing, does he? And we're not we're not coming back here. Or, or hopefully, by the time we, we do have to come back here, hopefully by then he'll learn something or they have somebody else. That way, it's that way sometimes in our Christian life. It, people can see and it's obvious. And they go, man, if that's Christianity, if, that, if, that's, the, if that's what they're teaching down there, uh, uh, we should be a good example of these. And self-control is a key to just so much uh, of it. And at this point, I'd like to quote one of the more obscure prophets. Uh, you might not remember these uh, words of, of deep lament, almost as if they were inspired. It, the, that great prophet of the people, Merle Haggard, from uh, 1969, he said in the song, I can't, get my, I can't hold myself in line. He said, I'm going off of the deep end. I'm slowly losing my mind. I disagree with the way that I'm living, but I just can't hold myself in line. Hey, my weakness is stronger than I am. Guess I've always been the losing kind. Now I'm full speed ahead down the wrong road of life, and I can't get myself in line. And that is the lament of the guy without self-control. He knows what to do, but he doesn't do it. And that actually is one of the differences, I think, between that old generation, now gone, of uh, of singers and some of these new ones. Some of these old guys, they knew what was right and wrong. They had a moral core. They didn't always follow it. And I think you could hear the lament in their voice as they sang about not following it. But some of these new guys, you wonder if they even have a moral core to, to cause them to lament. But uh, this, and he was particularly talking about alcohol getting a hold of his life. My weakness is stronger than I am. He didn't have self-control. Of course, Haggard in particular, since his mother was a member of the church and tried to raise him in the church, he particularly knew, uh, especially knew right and wrong. 
But uh, no, he didn't. He didn't follow. So what we find, if we don't follow, we're going to be in a bad way if we don't get a hold of ourselves. And so in all those external things that we, we saw, prayer and study, attendance and giving and and uh, 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 things like that, if we don't have self-control, it won't get accomplished properly. But there's one more area that just absolutely uh, will not work without self-control. And that's the favorite topic of everybody uh, in church, submission. We just love to talk about submission, don't we? Now, I, I have known in my life a few uh, uh, fellows who really like to talk about submission. And the thing that you always got the impression of is that they were making sure everybody would submit to them. That's the only people I've ever known who ever talk about submission or ever have that, I, in my knowledge and presence, who ever talked about submission in a way that approached something of glee. And we are to submit. And this is where people, oh, okay, he's going to talk about husbands and wives. Yeah, I am for a minute, but not much. And those guys who did with the gleam in their eye talk about submission. They they sure did seem to like telling the ladies to submit. But our first submission, and this is really hard for us, and it's hard for the men more than the women, is our understanding that submission is to Christ first. That we do all in his name. We submit fully to him in Colossians 3 and 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks. We're to be thankfully submissive. Thankfully submissive. And that's in all the things we do for and in Christ. As it says in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. And the man is the head of a woman. And God is the head of Christ. So notice that a man might, if he's a married fellow, a man might have a wife in subjection to him, that the man is the head of a woman. But before that and beyond that, the head of every man is Christ. And so I'm always looking back at it. I wondered about those guys who talked about submission, again, with a gleam in their eye, and they got all excited about it. If you talked about their submission to Christ in the same way, would they have been near so excited? Or they're the one having to bend the knee and follow. Or they're the one who's not leading, but submitting. And Christ is the head of every man. And so we all have the same head. And, you know, we think about these beautiful figures of Christ and his church. Christ is the foundation. He's the cornerstone of the foundation. And we're the living stones built on him. And now lovely picture where we're being built into a holy temple in Christ. Uh, Christ is uh, our king, and we have the soldiers of Christ imagery, and some of us can we can get behind the the marshaling in marshal and uh, aspect and the uh, banner waving and the band playing and the flags flags are waving. We love that image of Christ our victorious King, and we follow along in His triumph. And then we also have Christ, and we have God as the head of the family that we're adopted as children and oh what provision and and what care and what concern he gives us as a father loves his child and on we go and now if we think about it too much some people don't like the imagery of he's the shepherd and we're the sheep because calling people sheep today people say sheeple that, that's not all that complimentary uh because you know, the more you think about yourself as the sheep uh, the less complimentary that seems, but also if you think about the way we wonder and need a shepherd, need somebody to watch over us, need somebody to feed us, get us across the creek, get us to the green grass, keep uh, the, the predators away. Yeah, it turns out maybe sheep and, and shepherd, that's not the most complimentary thing to us in our pride, but yeah, we can kind of see that. All right, now, how about the one of Christ and his church? He's the husband and we are the church. We are the, the bride. 
Hold on. I, I you ladies might like that one a lot. Cause there in this picture you get a perfect husband. A loving and sacrificial husband. A, a husband who never does any wrong. A husband who always looks out for your best interest and is never selfish and is never pig headed. You you ladies probably like this bride imagery uh more than us men do if we think about it. Because how many of us fellows like in any way to be compared to or taught like or even a metaphor of uh, where we get to be the feminine party. That doesn't happen to me very often in my life. I'm not, I've am not. i never been mistaken for a lady. Uh, you know, if, if I ever dressed up even as Halloween, uh, you know, in a, in a dress, it'd be all the more comical. Uh, but the thing with the feminine aspect there, that's us. We're we're the wife in this scenario that needs the protection and needs the care and needs the provision of the husband, and we submit and follow him. And sometimes when people talk about the bride of Christ, they don't emphasize that near so much as they get into those other figures of Christ and his church. They they and they act like that submitting part. Well, that's definitely uh, for their marriage and their wife. But that's not so much emphasized in their relationship to Christ. But submission should not be viewed as a feminine aspect. It is in one regard in marriage. But when we submit to government, and oh, how much have we argued and fussed and kicked about that lately? Because the government's telling us a couple things we don't want to do. but. 1 Peter 2, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to king as one in authority or to governor as to him as sent for punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do right. Submit to government. Servants, be submissive to your masters. There's a master-slave relationship, awful lot of parallels and application to employer-employee relationships. To parents in that time of life, children, obey your parents in all things. And at church, to elders, obey your leaders and submit to them. And so any thought about submission, which again, us fellas often think of, that's a feminine aspect. That's for the lady folks. Okay, we're going to have a lesson on submission. You ladies have a nice ladies Bible class about that. And we'll, we'll see how well you learned that lesson afterwards, sweetie. Go on, Will. I'll meet you afterwards. I'll take you to dinner. It's Submission can't just be that and just can't be in that relationship. It's every In every relationship, there's somebody who is the head and there's somebody that submits. And we are in about 9 or 10 or 12 or 14 different kind of relationships. And our general posture is submission. And if nothing else, to Christ. Even if you, if so, if you were the head of the country and the head of the church and the preacher of that church, maybe there wouldn't be anybody on earth for you to submit to. But you'd still submit to Christ. But even if you were in the head and superior relationship, the authoritative relationship, in everything you did, you'd still have this instruction, Ephesians five twenty one, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And that's not even about relationship. You know, that, that's not even about anyone who has any kind of power dynamic there. It's everybody be subject to everybody else in the fear of Christ. You're all the servants of all. You're all the servants of all. Again, Ephesians 5.21, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And there's only one way that's even possibly going to happen. And that is with an absolute amount of self-control, purposely practiced, purposely taken on as an aspect of the fruit of the Spirit. This won't be taught anywhere else but in the Holy Scriptures. Submit, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. I sometimes wish, not that women shouldn't be taught to, respect their husbands and submit to the husbands they should because that's in the scripture. 
But I sometimes wish it was required that every time somebody read one of those passages, they had to read Ephesians 5.21 with it to let everybody know that we're all in subjection to one another. So in leaving off all the things that God in the Holy Book told us don't do, you're going to need self-control. In doing the things that God said to do, you're going to need self-control. There's going to be a few things where they're congenial to our mindset where God says, don't do that. And you're like, I didn't want to do that anyway. All right, well, that's easy. You got that one covered. But there's a bunch of stuff it says not to do that we all want to do from time to time and in a fleshly mind. And there's other things that he tells us to do. And we think, oh, I'm glad he told me to do that. I'm happy to do that. I'd love to do that. And sometimes that's because we've conformed our mind to the scriptures. But sometimes it's just a a thing that we're, we're happy to do by nature. That's fine. But there's also things we're told to do that we won't like doing. We won't want to do it. But we'll do it because he said so. And so the fullness of following, not just because we like it, but the fullness of following in the do it and in the don't do it, it's going to come down to self-control. And I think that's why it's listed here as the final and ultimate part of the fruit of the Spirit.